author of Kedibar and Tab Lab. And as you already know, it's an adventure story. So I had a lot of fun creating this story, and um, hope you have a lot of fun listening to the passages, and I'll also be talking a little bit about what inspired me to write the book and how it did it. So one of the first things I want to show you, I have this set up here. This is the map of the story, and every single book has a copy of the map in front of it because I think every good adventure story has a map. So you can follow along in the book and then follow along the map, all the different journeys uh, and places that Ken Bar goes to as he goes on his adventure here. So the first passage we're going to read is from the beginning of the book, and it's after an exciting section where he was on a ship and they saw pirates in the horizon. So. <clears throat> Red, black, scent of iron, sting of smoke, the screams of men dying as swords ran them through while they were hurled overboard. An overwhelming onslaught of sight, sound, and sensation assaulted Tedavar as he emerged into the open, splintered wood running the length of the deck, where blood stained the planks that were as yet unbroken. A frenzied breeze caught the sails of both ships, the white sails that Tedavar knew by heart straining away from the masts they were fastened to, as if to flee the carnage below them, whilst the onerous billowing of black sails sent a thrill of fear into Tedbar's heart, freezing him in place, rooting the soles of his feet to the rough cedar beneath, cruel-hearted ravens swooping down to pluck out the eyes of the dead. Bodies sprawled about the deck. From their uniforms, most were the soldiers and sailors that Tedbar had labored under for the voyage so far, some were fellow slaves, a scant handful were pirates, and Tedavar's heart sank as his fears received absolute confirmation. Unless the bloodthirsty buccaneers wished it, not one person was to escape the carnage alive. Even if Tedavar and his companions were to gain the far side of the ship, not even the Shane Sea was a safe escape. As he stared in terror at the yellow, orange, and red plumes that flamed ever higher about the waves they burned so brightly on, Tenbar understood for the first time why these marauders struck terror into those who tangled with them. Who else could set the very sea in light? So that's the, one of the exciting passages from the book where it's a little bit inspired by history. If you know anything of the Greeks and the Persians, they had these great naval battles and the, they would set the sea on fire and really terrify the other side. And so I kind of took that idea and put it into my story a little bit because I thought it was just a really cool idea. Not only are you have pirates who are that come along and steal from you and maybe take you prisoner for a ransom, but they're also going to make it so that you can't escape because they're going to set the sea on fire. And anybody who knows how to swim is going to maybe take a couple steps back from the boat edge and you know not look down and look, they're like oh I can't jump in there and people who don't know how to swim they're just going to be completely terrified and given the day and era that this is set in it's kind of medieval times not everyone is going to know how to swim so even if they're on a boat they kind of got put on so that's kind of a fun little thing that I included that I really thought was fun um, and then you can see from the cover they have these flames on their swords, that's the, the black sails of the pirates that are flying and everything. So like, when you see it, you know it's your last day. So obviously though, Tenbar does manage to escape, and you'll have to read on to figure out how that happens, but I wanted to go ahead and read a little bit from another part of Tenbar's journey, where he is, he's going through the mountains, and after he's gone through the mountains, he's had a run-in with some, some sketchy characters. And after he escapes them, he's getting closer to the desert. And you can see here, here's the mountains, and then here's the desert. And he's got to make it across the desert. And it's just him at this point, so he doesn't have a lot of friends to help him out. And he's just trying to think, how am I going to do this by myself? And then, no more than a puff of dust at first. The disturbance grew as it near, drew near Tenbar's resting spot. When forms emerged from the swirling sand, Tenbar belatedly realized that the mounted riders he now saw were the ones kicking up all the sand. 
more than two score of dark and tan bodies raced across the desert sands, the figures' cloaks streaming behind them as they flowed through the dirty desert. To Tenbar's dismay, one broke from the party and streaked toward Tenbar, coming upon the young man and his horse in a matter of minutes. The woman stopped short in front of Tenbar, circling him as the rest of the party flashed by. What have we here? State your name and purpose, stranger. Tenbar of Havla, en route to Eistis, Tenbar said, and had Kalia, his horse, take a few steps back as the woman pressed in more closely. I see they. A sane person would stay far from that city. Though there was a question implied in the woman's tone that Tenbar was not sure who knew the answer to. Yes, right. Well, I shall be on my way then. In this heat? Surely you meant to wait out the worst of the day out here and travel on by night. Tenbar dipped his head affirmatively. And who gave you permission? Tenbar was taken aback. I thought free passage through the Durka was granted to all. The woman's expression turned hard before Tenbar could blink. Not the thieves, she said, and Tenbar tightened his grip on Kalea's reins. Surely you've heard of Carrion of the Durka? Tenbar shook his head although it occurred to him that he had heard the name carry on before. The bandits that had chased him had hurled it at him alongside many colorful exclamations and accusations of robbery. Tenbar's heart sank, and he had half a mind to kick Kalia into a gallop. If they made a break for it fast enough, they might have a chance. The woman was still watching them with a wary expression. A light breeze rustled the loose ends of her headscarf. I suggest you dismount and walk away, she said. I cannot reach the kingdom of the West without a horse or supplies, Tenbas replied. Then you should not have taken one of my father's mares, she returned, no hint of sympathy in her voice. It was not I who took her, Tenbas said. I didn't know. I can pay. It's hardly payment if the gold you're using was ours to begin with, now is it? At Tenbas shocked cut gasp, she continued. Two of my father's lieutenants reported an intruder at the Kalka readout. Unfortunately, they lost him, but not before they noted the direction he was riding in. Not long after that, one of our healers sent word that a young man had paid for her services using coins marked in half her our man. We've been looking for you, Tenbar Pavla. Are you of a mind to return my gelding's kin to us? The woman nudged her steed forward, and Tenbar bolted slashing through the ropes, binding his goods to Kalia, who reared up, startled by the baggage forcefully hitting the ground. Freed of the excess weight, Kalia launched into a gallop as Tenbar crouched low over her back. A piercing whistle cut through the air, and Tenbar had to fight with Kalia as she instinctively responded to it. The youth chanced to glance backward and was dismayed to discover that not only was the woman chasing after him, but several other riders had wheeled around and left the main party, quickly closing the distance between them and Tenbar. He pressed on, dropping into a canter after roughly half a league. Each time he craned his neck to look back, it seemed that he gained a few further L's betwixt himself and the bandits, and Tenbar found himself heartened as he raced through the unforgiving landscape. Something flashed from the corner of Tenbar's eyes, and the next instant the breath was punched out of him. In surprise, he reflexively tightened and relaxed his grip on the reins, and the next arrow that slammed into him knocked him out of his saddle. Time slowed as Tedbar was flung through the air, the sky above so, so blue, each grain of sand crystal clear as it flew by his line of vision. His cheek brushed Kalea's thigh, and her tail whipped him across the eyes, and all Tedbar could think before his head connected with the ground was arches. That's another exciting passage from the book where he runs into the bandits and, you know, what happened earlier in the book was that he went through the, the mountain and he stumbled across a hideout. And if, and if you've ever played any video games where you're in the mountains, you know, you're like, oh, let me just take some of this loot because I'll need it for my next journey. So Tenbar is going along he's like, you know, here's some gold and you belong to people who steal from other people anyway. I'll just take some. But, they, they weren't happy about that. Like, even though they stole it from other people, they said, well, we don't want you stealing from us. And <laughs> the horse that he bought from somebody, was his horse was already stolen, and he didn't realize that. And 
that's why they're chasing him. And he doesn't realize as he's riding along, as I read, that it, you know, okay, well maybe he's gaining some distance between before them, but then they have archers. And something that's really cool is if you ever look up the people of Mongolia, there are people that um, rode on horseback, and these horses are still very important in the culture today. We people of Genghis Khan. Yeah, the idea that they would just ride around on horseback and be very good archers while they were doing it. There's all sorts of special techniques that you can use as you're firing arrows. And this is these people's livelihood of the Durka Desert in the book. And so, of course, they're not going to miss, especially when he's one person all the way in front of them and just going in a straight path. It's going to be easy for them to, to hit him with their arrows. So he falls and is, it's a desert, so he doesn't have very much chance of survival. but. Don't want to spoil it too much, but here's the, you see a little oasis in the desert here, and that's the house of Vida. And so she's a wise old woman, because every story is a wise old person, and she's going to help him figure out how to get back on the next leg of his journey. So, now the thing about Ted Bar is the whole reason he's trying to get home is because he lives way over here, and he's stuck on the other side. He's got this girl that he's in love with. They got engaged, but in secret, because she's a free woman, and he's a slave, and he wants to get back to her and try to figure out how to make this work. And we get to a point in the book where he has some flashbacks of all the times that he spent when he was young on the island of Havla. Um, and just to know, I wanted to put here, I like to read when I'm reading in my English accent, because when I was younger, that's where I lived, and I was born there, actually, and so a lot of the things about the castles and everything like that. That's from memories that I had when I was younger exploring. If you ever get the chance to go overseas and visit, um, I definitely wouldn't recommend that you do so because there's just some really cool places and castles that are thousands of years old. And it's really nice to take that experience that I had when I was younger pretending to be in those castles and putting that into this book in this medieval era. So, and another thing I did, and me and my brothers did when we were kids, is we would make bows and arrows and pretend that we were bandits and things like that. And that's something that Tenbar and his friends do when they're living on this island of Papua. Because even though this is kind of a slave island where they live, uh, they it's an island so we can't really get off. And there's got guards stationed around. Um, this island protects kind of the mainland from some of the storms that would come along. Uh, so they have a little bit more freedom to be on the island and they can kind of run around. They just can't leave so much unless, like Kedvar is, they're put on a ship to, to do work for people. So this is a passage. And actually, yeah, I'll put this back around to the front here. There's a passage right here that I'm going to read with the, the quote. You can read right here. Read along with me. Sorry about this. Read along with the quote here as I read the extended version of this quote from Tenbar's childhood. Well, his youth. He's, he's not much younger, but there's passages when he first meets his, the girl he's in love with, and then as they're a little older. So, <clears throat> a crackle in the bushes just ahead caught Tenbar's attention, and he hurried forward cautiously, injured ankle forgotten. He ducked behind a tree and crept onward in a crouch, a tiny dagger clutched in one hand. And further, and he stopped and waited, listening intently. Utter silence reached his ears, and Tenbar's heartbeat rose as he realized that whatever was in the woods had caused the winter woodland chatter to hush, as if the whole forest tore an edge. Waiting. With barely a whisper of noise, Tenbar put away his knife and unslung his short hunting bow, notching an arrow to it. Carefully, very carefully, he lifted his head above the holly cluster he was hiding behind. All was still in the clearing beyond. The youth straightened some more, keeping an eye on his surroundings. Abruptly, the bush on the opposite side of the clearing shook violently, and a man stumbled out. Tenebar was on his feet in an instant, bow full draw. So that's a shorter passage, but this is when he runs into some of the other famed people from around. And there's bandits that roam the mainland that kind of uh, have this idea because the king is a tyrant that they're going to help out the people 
that live around and a little bit kind of like a Robin Hood idea where they maybe steal from the rich, give to the poor. So it's kind of fun to put some inspiration in from history and from legend and this idea that Robin Hood himself was based on lots of different other people that roamed the English countryside at one point. So taking inspiration, of course, is always going to be bandits when you have a medieval era. And these guys, maybe they travel around and help people, and particularly this one character that Kevin Bond meets here is going to be a guy that he meets later on in the book, and this encounter that they have endears the, him to the bandit a little bit, so when he meets up with him again, the bandit doesn't automatically shoot him like the desert bandits do. So when you, you know, meet someone, you have that connection with them, sometimes it comes in handy later on, and that's what's going on in that passage. But when Ken Barnes younger, he's on his territory now, on his island, and he's the one with the bow, and he's got to say, okay, who are you? What do you want? How do we figure out our next step from here? So that's all in the book. And, Ken Bar with his friends figure out what they're going to do with the bandit and whether or not they're going to turn him over to the authorities. So, as we go along, one of the things that makes Ken Bar special is that he is a poet and he has this ability to make up stories and poems on the spot. And kind of took inspiration a little bit from the idea of traveling bards and poets from, again, ancient times. And if you've ever heard of Homo, and the Odyssey, Homer was a blind poet and he created this saga, although some people think that maybe it was several different poets putting this all together. And Tenbar, just like we have the Odyssey, Tenbar has the Aegon cycle, and he, it's about this hero who travels around Tenbar's world, he travels around Tenbar's world and gets in all sorts of different adventures, and so as Tenbar's traveling along, he'll remember, oh, this story about Aegon takes place at this spot, and I'm traveling through the woods now, and this is where this sinkhole story happens in Aegon's cycle. And so it's kind of a little bit neat to follow. Ten bars, he's thinking and connecting these adventures just like the Greek people did, and they would travel around and connect, oh, this is where Hercules lived, this is Mount Olympus, and all these neat places. So taking a little bit of inspiration from that was a way to give this story more depth and more life. And Tenbar will have these little poems as he goes along. So in this section of the book, he literally has to sing for his life. And he's, he's given an instrument, and he's going to make up this poem and see if it's good enough whether the people he's fallen in with at this point will let him live. So this is the poem. Tenbar finished his poem and stretched out his hand for a cup of water. He drank quickly and resumed speaking, changing the melody once more and infusing it with the sounds of the kingdom of the East. Upon that far off shore, quickly I healed, and friends I found who wished me well. Serenji I discovered ruined an empty shell and fled before the rock of the pirate's seal. Against the council of friends I turned to the hills, their war words warned me of bandits, vicious, cruel. I knew not to tread there, that much was true, but of that flaming sea I had drunk my fill. A horse I acquired, lithe, trusty, and red. Alas, from desert bandits had she been stolen. Payment I offered with coins gleaming golden, but with a score of barbed arrows, they left me for dead. At the house of Bida, I found supper for my source, and restored homeward, I fastened my eyes once more. And also in the poems, because Tedba has listened to all of the ancient poems a lot and studied them, he is able to infuse them with kind of a very educated air, even though he's not supposed to be educated. When he's in the kingdom of the east, he kind of hides that a little bit. When he's in the kingdom, I mean, in the kingdom of the west, he hides that a little bit. But in the kingdom of the east, he can kind of be a little bit freer with his level of education and let people know that he kind of does have a scholarly background. And uh, at the end of the story, he kind of gets rewarded for that a little bit. I don't want to spoil it too much, but he gets to end up doing something he loves associated with literature. So that's a, 
an offering, um, an example of what you find sprinkled throughout the book of the little poems, and he has to use his brain a lot. That's how he gets out of situations, his, his quick wit, and thinking through, well, what's the answer to this riddle? Or what poem can I make up to get myself out of this situation? Or what words of advice can I offer that I've learned from these stories? So that's a, a little bit of characterization that drives the story forward. Because if he didn't have that poetry, then maybe you know he wouldn't have that unique thing that saves his life here and there. So here is a section of the story where he's fallen in with some other rogues around, and they're going to go on a mission. And he kind of has to go with them, because part of the story is he's trying to get home. and. These rogues were also going toward the city of Isis for their own mission, and they don't trust him not to run off and leak the plans of their mission to anyone else. So what they're going to do is say, come along with us, and if you prove yourself in battle, we'll let you go and do your own thing. So when they were ready, Khan slipped out of the jar. Tiana and Ted by his wake, leaving the others to guard the tent. John Lee chose well, Khan murmured, fetching a few items from his saddlebag. The site is easily defensible, and from a distance, the tents blend seamlessly into the hills. He shook his head when Ted Bum went to Mount Kalir. Our strategy relies on stealth. The guards will hear us coming long before they see it, if we ride. Pick it. Khan reached into his jerkin to withdraw a short sword. Ted Bum's fingers trembled as he grasped the hilt. He had used a weapon with lethal intent only once before. Cutting down the pirate who had caused Will's death. But he had been half senseless from shock and grief. He could not recall the face of the corsair, only that he wore a red cap, red as the blood that had gushed from his wound before it toppled to the broken deck of the cargo ship. A rough glove over Tenbar's hand broke him from his musings, and he looked up, numb from more than the cold. We are at war, Khan only said. If the moment comes when you must strike, Strike! So saying, the outlaw strode to the front of the small group that had assembled, headed also by Lightfingers. He nodded to the other bandit. To me! Lightfingers turned and spread across the moor, so swiftly that Tenbar thought he ought to be called Lightfeet instead. Not once did the man break the grueling pace, and first 44 longs later, Tenbar found himself gasping for air as the party neared their destination. When at last the man paused, Tenbar was tempted to fling himself upon the ground and never rise again. So there's more adventures, but the rest of the book is kind of getting into spoiler territory with a really cool plot twist, so I don't want to give that away. And you said you've read the book, so you know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's a great hopefully that story. will encourage you to give it a go. And if you want to skip to the end and read the twist, that's totally fine. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to open it up now for any questions you might have. So just fire away and I'll do the best of my ability to answer them for you.